Welcome to another edition of Northwestern Outdoors Radio, the award-winning show covering fishing, hunting, conservation, destinations, and other outdoors recreation across the greater Northwest. Northwestern Outdoors is brought to you by Max Lur, Sportsman's Warehouse, Sina Sea Seafood, and Wallawa County Chamber of Commerce in the Northern Pike Minnow Sport Reward Fishery Program. And now, let's see what's happening this week with your host, John Cruz. If you're an angler, I'm sure you are aware that Berkeley make some products that actually attract fish or have them hold on to the bait a whole lot longer. That includes the classic power bait that folks use for trout and their soft plastics, which are infused with scent that attracts fish and their Berkeley Gulp products. Well, it turns out that there are certain scents will actually repel fish. Steve Quinn, writing in the latest edition of In Fisherman Magazine, spoke with Dr. Keith Jones, the retired lab director for Berkeley Fishing's Biology Lab. And according to Dr. Dr. Jones, the most repulsive materials that will send fish fleeing are insect repellents that contain DEET. In his words, the substance seems to repel about everything that swims, crawls, flies, or runs. Bass detect it at concentrations less than one part per million, and touching a lure after applying DEET renders it repulsive for well over an hour. Jones said that detergents and soaps also are offensive to fish, and some food preservatives, particularly those derived from benzene, also repel fish. In addition to this, the active ingredient in many sunscreens, PABA, also repels bass. On the other hand, some substances widely considered repulsive to fish are not. The amino acid L-serine found in human skin does spook salmon, and that's why you see a lot of salmon guides wearing gloves, but it has no effect at all on bass. So there you go. Some repelling scents you don't want to have on your lures the next time you go fishing. This week on Northwestern Outdoors Radio, we're going to have a couple of conversations with Aaron Kindle. He is the Sporting Advocacy Director for the National Wildlife Federation. And we're going to start off talking about a bill that's been introduced into Congress that is very dangerous if you believe in conservation. It's called the Return Act. It would repeal the Pittman-Robertson Act, which has provided billions of dollars over the years to help conserve wildlife. It is a tax that we all pay as hunters and shooters when we buy ammunition or archery-related products. It turns out there are a few congressmen in the greater Northwest that are supporting this bill, and you might want to consider giving them a call or shoot them an email and ask them to reconsider their positions. We'll tell you more about this in a minute. We'll also talk to Aaron in detail about the National Wildlife Federation, the history of this organization, and some of the other things they are working on these days. Bob Loomis will be joining us for another extended Max Minute. This time the subject is ocean salmon fishing because there's coho and chinook to be caught right now off the Oregon and Washington coast and he wants to help you catch them. We've also got a special opportunity coming up for kids between 12 and 16 years of age who have never been hunting before. It's a mentored youth deer hunt, a three-day event going on near Kettle Falls in northeast Washington at the end of August, it's being put on by the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and several partner organizations to include the First Hunt Foundation. And we'll be talking to Rick Brazell, the president of the First Hunt Foundation, to give you more details about what's involved with this deer camp for kids and how you can sign up your kid for a chance to go hunting. And with that, let's kick things off as we always do with another edition of Sportsman Spotlight brought to you every week by the Ag Information Network of the West. A steely fishing for steelies, David Sparks, Sportsman Spotlight. I had the pleasure of playing in a men's hockey league with Jeremy Milmux. That was pretty big company. Jeremy was captain of the Idaho Steelheads in the 3 4 season in which the Steelheads won the Kelly Cup. In fact, Milsey's jersey has been retired and hangs in the CenturyLink Arena in downtown Boise. He was passionate about hockey, and he has another passion now. One of the greatest steelheads in the history of the steelheads has appropriately taken up steelhead fishing. Is that correct? Yeah, everything from steelhead to salmon to cutthroats, rainbows, you name it. What prompted the interest in fly fishing? It's always been in my blood. My grandfather got me into fishing at a young age, and then I had a roommate in college as a fly fisherman from Minnesota. And I moved here, and actually one of my friends out here, Brian Oakland, got me into some fly fishing here, a steelhead. So we went up to Riggins, and he kind of introduced it to me and showed me the ropes and got me into it big time. Once I got into it, I got hooked. I love it. No pun intended on getting hooked, right? No. I've hooked myself a few times, though. 
<laughs> Tell me about the Riggins trip. Was it a successful trip? Yeah, we went down to Riggins during the week. Just a regular pull. Caught my first steelhead there and the big salmon. And after the big salmon, another friend of his who's a guide took us out, did some spay rod fishing and taught me a little bit about fly fishing on the uh, little salmon. Got into a couple spots and we're getting ready to leave and he's like, we'll try one more hole. So he jumped in there and he was down the river and that's when I hooked my first steelhead. Just flowed a little egg pattern down and got a little bump and set it and from then on, chase the steelhead was a passion of mine. It was awesome. I loved it. David Sparks, Sportsman Spotlight. This is the sound of wireworms destroying winter wheat crops live on radio. You can't see it because it's radio. Just like you can't see it in your field because wireworms are underground. But you will see the crop damage now and next spring as they multiply. Stop them. Taraxa F4 seed treatment eliminates wireworms. Like this. It also knocks out fungal disease. Sound good? Taraxa F4 seed treatment from BASF. Game on, plant health. Game over, wireworms. Always read and follow legal directions. Let us be totally honest about a very important subject. Agriculture is amongst the most important industries in the world. Everybody has to eat, and what you are eating formulates who you are. And it doesn't matter who you are. You should be aware of the trends, the science, the issues surrounding all things agriculture. That's where the Ag Informationist comes in. We diligently cover every aspect of agriculture on a daily basis. It's our passion. It's our job. It is our commitment. You're back in with Northwestern Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. We've got something very special to tell you about. If you've got a kid and you want to introduce that kid, whether it be a boy or girl, to deer hunting, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife is partnering with several groups to put on a mentored deer hunt for youth at the end of August. It's a deer camp taking place from August 26th through the 28th at the Sherman Creek Wildlife Area Headquarters near Kettle Falls, Washington. With us here to tell you more about it is Rick Brazell. He's the president of the First Hunt Foundation. He's helping to put this on. Rick, great to have you on board. Great to be here, John. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about what's going to happen at this deer camp? You betcha. This deer camp is called the Chris Christensen Memorial Deer Camp. And it's named after Chris Christensen, who was one of the managers there at the wildlife area. He is also a mentor with the First Hunt Foundation. Just spent tons of his life helping kids and youth learn about the outdoors and about hunting. So we dedicated it in his name just to kind of honor him. He's passed away, of course, and so we wanted folks to understand there's people out there that give a lot of their time and energy. But the camp is designed to, uh, somebody could come that's never hunted before at all. We're going to have a day of teaching them how to shoot, a day of skills, a day of tracking, how you cut up an animal, that sort of thing. So it's the whole deal. And then at the end of it, we go out and they get to harvest their first animal. It would be a doe in this case. Folks, this is open to kids who are 12 to 16 years old who have never hunted and don't necessarily have a family member or other connection to show them how to go about deer hunting. So your organization, the First Hunt Foundation, along with Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, the Inland Northwest Wildlife Council, and the Kalispell Tribe are all working together to put this camp on. Let's talk about where folks are staying and food and how much it costs. You betcha. And the, also, we have the National Wild Turkey Federation folks are helping us as a partner as well. Don't want to leave those guys out. Well, the cost is, is free. We don't charge anything. The First Hunt Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit. Our mission, long-term mission, is to save hunting as part of our American culture. And so we want to recruit as many new hunters as we can. So 10 years from now, we're still hunting. So this count doesn't cost anything. But the, uh, we get donations from various local vendors, businesses. The foundation has raised funds, and so we have enough money to go out and purchase the food. The Kalispell tribe has been fantastic. They provide salmon, so we can have a salmon meal. And there'll be 60 people in the camp when you count all the new hunters and their family members and mentors and other folks. So we're feeding a lot of people. And they also provide a bison burger at the last time camp from last year. So lots of food. Everybody goes away fat and happy, you know, as far as the food goes. Now, in terms of the accommodations, are you just bringing your own tent and pitching it or a camper or an RV if you have one? Yep, all of the above. Most people bring tents and that sort of thing. There's a room for a few campers out there. And so they could bring a camper, and a few of them would stay in a local motel, but we start real early in the morning, so they'd have to get up and be there early. But 
as a general rule, everybody's there, and we all sit around the campfire talking and learning and, and having a, a great camaraderie. This sounds like a wonderful event, and this is a great way to recruit new hunters into the sport that otherwise we would never get in there. How many young hunters are going to be able to participate in this deer camp? Well, we're going to take 12 new hunters this time. Last year, we did the same thing. We have accommodations as far as access to land that they can hunt on for 12. And so 12 folks will be able to get their first deer and get this great experience, as well as their family members can watch and be there as well. So a lot of folks are getting the benefit of the camp besides just the 12 new hunters. The topics you're covering here include seminars about the ethics of hunting, how to ask landowners for permission to hunt on their property and be respectful of those landowners, properly tagging the harvested animals, the gear you ought to have for deer hunting. You already mentioned this. You're going to do some target shooting at the gun range, which is critical. And you're even going to show them how to go ahead and skin and clean those deer once they have them down. I think this is great. It really is the whole package, like you said, to, to get a new hunter started and hopefully launch a lifelong love for this sport. Yeah, and it's not a one-and-done deal. At least we don't want it to be. We've got at least 200 mentors with the First Hunt Foundation that are scattered around the state of Washington. And so what we're hoping is they get this experience and then we hook them up either with the mentors that are there or somebody else that's in the state. So it continues on. They had this experience, and then what's next? Possibly a turkey hunt, possibly going after waterfowl, uh, just learning more about shooting. So there's more after the camp. We hope there's more after the camp by hooking them up to people they can talk to, they can call, you know, they have questions about hunting. They've got somebody to talk to. It's not just a one and done and we're, it's over. Rick, why don't you tell me a little bit more about the First Hunt Foundation, the organization you're the president of? You betcha. Well, we started in April of 2015, so we've been around since then, and currently we're growing really fast. We're operating in about 37 states now, so we're a national organization. We have close to 800 volunteer mentors that go out and train these folks to all the stuff that's happened at this camp, what we call one-on-one mentoring. So you, if you sign up with the foundation as a mentee or a new hunter, and you find somebody that can train you, you've got a friend to talk to, to call, to help you learn all the ins and outs of hunting, you know, putting in for big game, the gear you need, all that sort of thing. So we, once folks find a mentor and a mentee, they get paired up. We hope that's kind of a lifetime relationship, that they can call them at any time, learn all about the different kinds of hunting. Then, then we have chapters forming. The chapters, of course, and that's what's happening here. We have a ch- several chapters that are participating in this. And you get a chapter, you take advantage of our 501c3, and you go out and knock on doors and get donations. And that's what's happening here. A lot of the food's donating funds to for the food is being donated and equipment, that sort of thing. And the chapters can do all kinds of events. They might just have an event where it's a one day and we all get together and just learn how to shoot, spend the day teaching somebody how to side in a gun or that sort of thing. So it's a great organization to hook up with if you want to learn about hunting or if you've got the skills and you want to give some of your time back. We love to sign people up. We do background checks on them. We have liability insurance for our mentors, which is kind of cool. So if you take somebody out and heaven forbid something happens and you were to get sued, our liability insurance would protect you and help you get through that process. This is definitely an organization doing great things. What's the website for the First Hunt Foundation? The website is firsthuntfoundation.org. And you go there and you can do lots of things there. One of the things you can find a mentor. So there's what's called the mentor map. Uh, let's say there's a, a single parent that their are parents and their kid wants to learn how to hunt. They can go to that map. They hover over one of the little flags. It pops up the names of everybody under that zip code. So there may be 10 people under that zip code that live close to you. You just call them up and say, hey, I've got a person that would like to learn how to hunt. Could you help them? And if they couldn't, then they go to the next one. So it's pretty simple. I am so glad there's an organization like yours to get kids into hunting, and for that matter, uh, adults too. It's the First Hunt Foundation isn't just for kids, is it? 
It is not. In fact, we just started this year a new program for women. We have a national women's program director, so we're finding if we can get, uh, I mean, a lot of the girls and women would like to go out with women mentors. We have a, a ton of women mentors that would be able to train other women, and they might feel more comfortable going out with a, another lady out in the woods to, to learn things. We also have a new program, well, it's actually a couple of years old now, called Connecting Heroes and Hunters, which is about veterans, first responders, and folks that already have established peer groups that we can teach them how to be mentors if they're already hunters. And if they're not, then find somebody in their own peer group and teach them. So we have a veterans first responder program, a women's program, and, and then the youth program. Well, again, certainly some great stuff going on with the First Hunt Foundation. Check it all out at firsthuntfoundation.org. And if you have a kid that is 12 to 16 years old who's never hunted, and you live in the state of Washington, consider applying for the Mentored Deer Hunt and Deer Camp that's taking place August 26th through the 28th at the Sherman Creek Wildlife Area Headquarters near Kettle Falls in northeast Washington. There's going to be a lot of people applying. I believe they're going to just randomly draw the applicants, and you'll be informed soon whether or not you are lucky enough to attend this absolutely free deer camp that will get you started on the road to being a deer hunter. Just go to wdfw.wa.gov. That's wdfw.wa.gov. Go to the hunting page, look for the hunting clinics, and you should find more information there. Rick, thanks so much for sharing all of this with us today on Northwestern Outdoors Radio. Thanks. More of the great outdoors on Northwestern Outdoors Radio with John Cruz. It's time for another Max Minute, brought to you every week by Max Luer. And with us again is Bob Loomis. Bob, always good to have you on the air. Thank you, John. So, Bob, a lot of folks right now are focusing on catching coho and Chinook salmon off the Oregon and Washington coast. For those who maybe haven't done it much, let's go ahead and walk them through how to do it. You know, the first thing I'm going to use if I go out in the salt... I'm going to play around with what we call the new scent flash triangle flasher. It's a triangle flasher. It's a 360 degree rotation. It doesn't impart any movement on the lure itself is all it is is a a large attractor. But it's also, thus the name, scent flash. It's a giant scent disperser. I can fill it up with all sorts of different types of scents that I want to cut up and put some herring in there. I, I can put anchovies, shrimp, whatever any type of scent that I want in there, so I get that scent out and create more attraction to the fish. What are you going to fish behind it? Behind it, I will most likely fish the uh, Smile Blade herring rig. That way I can use a cut plug herring or a full herring behind it. It has its own action and is being attracted by that scent flash triangle. So any I, particular colors you recommend? You know, you can't beat chartreuses, especially out in the salt water. The uh, scent flash flasher has a high, high UV body, which is chartreuse, and I have have it in clear, and it's high UV also, so I can use that. But, you know, your chartreuses, your greens, your silvers, things like that on the herring rig. I've got a sparkle smile blade on there. So you're adding attraction to all of your product. All right. Big water. It's all about attraction. It's all about scent. That's why you want to go ahead and tie on the Max Scent Flash Triangle Flasher. And behind it, put a Max Smile Blade Herring Rig. You'll be into those coho and Chinook in no time at all. Game changing. That's the best way to describe the new Scent Flash UV Triangle Flasher from Max Lure Company. This 360 degree rotational inline flasher features a scent release system attracting salmon to the lure behind it like no other flasher on the market. Soak the free scent pad with any type of oil or gel, or load up the cavity with any type of bait for fishing success beyond your wildest dreams. It's the Scent Flash UV Triangle Flasher, only from Max Lure Company. 
Sportsman's Warehouse is America's premier outfitter with the gear you need for fishing, hunting, camping, paddling, cooking, and just about anything else you can do in the woods or in the water. With over 125 stores across America, there is bound to be a Sportsman's Warehouse near you with not only the gear you need, but also the experts to help you get the most out of the product you purchase. Head down to your local Sportsman's Warehouse today or shop online anytime at sportsmans.com. That's sportsmans.com. From a bull elk ripping a bugle across the valley to wing beats on a duck marsh, public lands and waters are integral to our outdoor heritage. Become a member of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers and stand up for our public lands and waters. Visit backcountryhunters.org today. Welcome back to Northwestern Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. We've got a bit of a political conundrum we are dealing with in Washington, D.C. There's a a move afoot to dismantle a couple of acts that have really benefited wildlife over several decades. And with us here to tell us more about the situation is Aaron Kindle, the Director of Sporting Advocacy for the National Wildlife Federation. Aaron, welcome to the show. Uh, Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So, Aaron, a Georgia congressman, Andrew Clyde, has introduced a bill called the Return Act that would dismantle the Pittman-Robertson Act and the Dingle Johnson Act. Let's start off by letting folks know what these two acts are and how they help wildlife. Yeah, the Pittman-Robertson Act, you basically can't overstate how important it is to conservation. It's, a, it's an excise tax on all firearms and ammunition and things like bows. And it, it's an 11% tax. And then if you take the Dingle Johnson Act, that's a excise tax on fishing equipment. And so these two things together go into the Wildlife Restoration Fund, and they provide state agencies and wildlife managers a lot of money every year to manage wildlife, to do habitat restoration, even sometimes to get access to different places for hunting and fishing and outdoor recreation. So the Robertson Act has been around for about 85 years. It came into effect in 1937 under President Franklin Roosevelt, and it was actually the seminal moment for the founding of the National Wildlife Federation as well. Back then, there was a a National Wildlife Conference that actually formed the National Wildlife Federation, and one of the first things we took up as an organization was getting the Pittman-Robertson Act passed. And since then, it's provided about $15 billion, a little over $15 billion for for restoration and habitat and wildlife management. Who is this congressman, Andrew Clyde, and why does he and 53 Republican co-sponsors want to repeal these acts? I have a hard time believing anti-hunting because hunting has a very strong following in Georgia. Yeah, you know, he claims it takes a, a stab at the Second Amendment because taxing something that is a right in the Constitution, he believes, is a, you know, a, taking away a, a right. But the interesting thing about that argument is that, you know, hunters and anglers have happily paid these two taxes for a long time, and they're actually pretty proud of, of that contribution to, to wildlife conservation. So, you know, with, with that kind of success, that kind of aiding state wildlife agencies and improving habitat in something that we don't notice when we go and buy guns and ammunition or, or bows, that's something that's just way too popular, been around way too long you know, an accepted part of conservation. We're proud of that, and we want to keep it there because it's, it's so successful and, and really allows us to contribute to, directly to the resource that we love so much. Oh, I agree. And, you know, there are folks who say, oh, hunters and anglers, they don't protect wildlife. And the fact of the matter is, through these acts, we certainly do. And it should be pointed out that hikers and campers who are buying tents and buying backpacks and buying camp stoves, they're not paying these taxes. They're not contributing anything to wildlife or habitat, are they? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously conservation groups, they do different things, and some of those folks are engaged with those groups, and, uh, you know, they do certain things. I don't want to say they do nothing, but they don't have a built-in funding mechanism like you just mentioned where they're, you know, year after year contributing to wildlife conservation. So, you know, I think that's how we look at this thing, right? We're, if we saw this bill pass, we're taking one of the chairs away from the table, you know, as opposed to bringing more chairs to the table and providing more tools and more funding for getting wildlife conservation done. We need more people at the table. We need more resources. We can't afford it this time with a third of the wildlife being, uh, you know, under threat. 
with things like chronic wasting disease, climate issues, lots of different things are threatening wildlife right now. It's the last thing we need is to take one of the greatest resources we know of and pull it from the table. What would happen if the Return Act passed and became a law? What would that mean for states who are trying to restore habitat, protect habitat for wildlife? It'd be devastating. You know, it would take away, like we've talked about, you know, the greatest guaranteed influx of resources that they can count on every year to do those things. And so then you'd have to be going to the state legislature, looking at the state budgets, different things like that to get that those funds. And we know what that means. It means they wouldn't be there and a lot less conservation would be done. And so that's really what's so problematic about this whole bill is it seems like this particular congressman just doesn't quite understand that or has really been misinformed about what Pippin Robertson and Dingle Johnson are really about. Well, and unfortunately, he has 53 co-sponsors, including some congressmen here in the greater Northwest, to include in Montana, Congressman Matthew Rosendale, who's an at-large congressional representative, in Idaho, Russ Fulcher, who is the congressman for District 1 in Idaho. And for our listeners tuning in out of Alturas, California today, Doug LaMalfa is the District 1 representative who is also supporting this bill. Should our listeners who don't want these acts repealed contact those congressmen and let them know that? Oh, absolutely. You know, democracy is not a spectator sport. We have to talk to our decision makers and, and help them understand this. You know, you mentioned Mr. Fulcher in Idaho. Multiple different papers in Idaho have, have editorialized about his problematic stance here. The Lewiston, Idaho paper is one in particular. So you're seeing, you know, this groundswell of people who just know this as good policy and the sporting community start to talk to these folks. And, you know, it kind of took us by surprise. And so right now we're in that reactive phase where we really need to do an education and outreach campaign to these offices. So I would highly encourage folks to definitely uh, contact their member of Congress and tell them why this is problematic. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of resources out there right now. If you're looking for this, you look this up on the news. Uh, nearly every major sporting organization and conservation organization has spoken about this. So there's a lot of information about it. Again, folks, uh, contact your congressman or congresswoman, wherever you are, and let them know that you do not support the Return Act if you care about supporting our fish and wildlife through the Pittman-Robertson Act, the Dingle-Johnson Act, two very successful acts that have provided, uh, like you heard, billions of dollars over the years for conservation. And specifically, Matthew Rosendahl in Montana, Russ Fulcher in Idaho, and Doug LaMalfa in Northern California, they're co-sponsoring this bill. So if these people are your congressmen, give them a call. Shoot them an email. Let them know that they really ought to reconsider their stance. There are some Republicans who have withdrawn their support. And I think it's because they probably didn't realize exactly what they were signing on to. Maybe these congressmen are the same and maybe you can change their mind. Again, democracy, like Aaron said, is not a spectator sport. Aaron, what's the website folks should go to to keep up on this situation and others affecting wildlife? Yeah, I'll tell you a few. Uh, NWF.org backslash outdoors is our sporting work here at the National Wildlife Federation. But if you just look up NWF Outdoors on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or we also have a podcast. And we just recently, uh, this morning, actually released a podcast on this subject for folks who want to listen. So look for NWF Outdoors wherever you get your podcasts and you find that episode we just released today. All right, NWF Outdoors, check that out and follow this situation and check out that podcast too. And again, get involved. Contact your congressman or congresswoman and let them know that you don't support the Return Act and you do support wildlife and conservation through the Pittman-Robertson Act and the Dingle-Johnson Act. Am I supposed to take a position on these things? I don't know, but I am because I feel strongly about this. And Aaron, I'm glad you are too. Thank you, sir. This portion of the show is brought to you by our friends at Cena Sea Seafoods. That's the company that delivers delicious, wild-caught Alaskan seafood right to your door. Everything from Copper River sockeye salmon to halibut to sable fish and even king crab legs. 
Better still, they are offering a 10% discount to our listeners. If you want to take advantage of that, go to SinaSea.com. That's S-E-N-A-S-E-A, SinaSea.com, and put in the promo code Outdoors Radio. Once you do that, you get 10% off your entire order. The website again, SinaSea.com, and the promo code for 10% off, Outdoors Radio. Anglers are getting a raise this year with the Northern Pike Minnow Sport Reward Fishery Program and the fish are biting. Here's how it works. First, register at a pike minnow station along the Columbia or Snake River. Next, go fishing for pike minnow and bring back all of them that measure 9 inches or longer. The fish are worth 6 8 or $10, and the more fish you catch, the more each one is worth. Keep an eye out for tagged fish, too, because those are worth 500 bucks. Go fishing, make money, and have fun. Find out more at pikeminnow.org. You're back in with Northwestern Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. We've got Aaron Kindle back on the line, the Director of Sporting Advocacy for the National Wildlife Federation, because I want to find out a little bit more about this organization. Aaron, welcome back. Thank you, sir. So why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about the history of the National Wildlife Federation and what this organization is all about. Yeah, we've been around since the mid-1930s. We were co-founded by somebody folks might know, a fellow named J. Ding Darling. He's the uh, original artist of the duck stamp, which many folks are probably aware of and carries on to this day that helps uh, migrating waterfowl across the country. And we were founded by the first ever National Wildlife Conference. And that was where gardeners, birders, hunters, anglers, just folks who were concerned about the wildlife decline that was happening, you know, in the 1930s and Dust Bowl era came together and said, we're going to form a federation and really work across the country to help habitat and wildlife and conservation. Uh, so we've been around since then. We're, we're a very strong federation. We're a true federation. We have 52 state and territorial affiliates, so pretty much one in every state across the country. And we're unique in that those affiliates write and vote on and drive the policy that the national organization works on. And we collaborate and work on that together. So we are a true federation. And, you know, if you can imagine any of the conservation issues that have happened throughout history, you know, we've been part of it, you know, since that time. So we're strong and we're, we're proud of the work we've done. And, you know, we're, we're really working hard to take the issues as they come in this new time where, you know, there's so much division, but wildlife and conservation are something that can really bring us together. I have learned to ask this question when it comes to conservation organizations, because some are decidedly anti-hunting, anti-fishing. What's the stance of the National Wildlife Federation when it comes to these activities? Definitively not anti-hunting or anti-fishing. I'm the director of sporting advocacy here at the National Wildlife Federation, so that means that I handle all of our hunting and fishing conservation, and we work on things with every major sporting organization you can think of you know, at all turns. And we are definitively on the side of hunters and anglers and work with them all the time. 30 or so of our affiliates that I mentioned those uh, out of those 52 are definitively what we call hook and bullet organizations. I work with them very closely. They lead with that hunter angler voice. You know, we're part of the American Wildlife Conservation Partners, which is a group of about 50 different national sporting organizations that works together on all kinds of policies that uh, are directly related to hunting and angling and the conservation of fish and wildlife. So we are definitively a pro-hunting and fishing organization. So let me ask you a question here about a, a current issue that has come up. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service under the Biden administration is proposing that lead ammunition and lead fishing tackle be banned from at least 20 national wildlife refuges, and that would be expected to expand potentially to all National Wildlife Refuges in the future. Has your agency come out with a position on this, and and what is it? No, we don't have a definitive position on that particular issue, but we do have a campaign that encourages hunters and anglers to switch to non-lead alternatives while in the field. And meaning whenever there's a vector with wildlife potential that a scavenger could come along and eat, you know, a carcass, your gut pile that's left in the field, you know, that's a good time to use non-lead ammunition. And, and we, we do that because we know that eagles have been poisoned by that and other scavengers. And so I think the main point there is, A, we know that, and the opportunity to do that is pretty easy, right? Just while you're in the field, we're not talking about at the range or other times, but while you're in the field and you know that the entrails or other parts of your harvested animal may be left out there, 
you know, use an alternative that doesn't have lead. But we want to do that in a completely voluntary manner. We do education and outreach, and we show hunters the, the alternatives to lead and what they might be able to use, but we're not pushing any law or regulation. And on the fishing side, there are non-lead alternatives, but they tend to be very pricey. Yeah, it depends exactly what application you're thinking about, right? Uh, sometimes they're in the fly fishing world, there's tungsten and, and other different bead heads and different things you might use fly fishing. And then in the spin fishing world, there's also some non-lead alternatives. They're starting to come down and be decent. Ice fish with different jigs that are non-lead. And you're starting to see a lot more of that. The sporting community themselves are asking for it. Because, you know, as we talked about before, the sporting community has a long history of wildlife conservation and we care about all wildlife. And I think just a general sportsman or woman is going to go, hey, if I can prevent harm somehow, I'll do that. And they look for the ways to do that. So I think it's not a huge sell for most folks. I think, you know, we don't want a lot of different options reduced when we're thinking about our sporting, you know, pursuits. But that's why we really promote doing it while we're in the field. Because usually when you're hunting big game or something like that, a few shots a year, that's not that big of a deal. You know, if you're hunting waterfowl, there's been a regulation in place for a long time that you can't use lead, so there's a lot of better options at this point, tungsten, steel, even some pretty good affordable stuff. So I think folks are starting to understand that issue. But again, I think the most important thing is that the sporting community is good at self-regulating and good at understanding the, the impacts they have on the environment. And we would much rather see that community move towards non-lead in the field rather than some sort of regulation or something that comes down and imposes it. What else is the National Wildlife Federation working on this summer? Oh man, you name it and it's in conservation and we're working on it. I think one of the biggest things that I would be remiss if I didn't mention is the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. And that is a, a bill we've been pushing for a few years now. It's bipartisan. It's very popular. It would provide $1.4 billion a year to the state agencies to manage wildlife that is basically threatened, right? So each state has what they call a state wildlife action plan. And those plans have laid out the species that really need help in those states that are under some sort of threat. And there's a lot in each state. And the Recovering America's Wildlife Act is really set out to aid those species. And some of them are sporting species, you know, cutthroat trout. In many states, bull trout up there in the Northwest. And, and so we really think that's something that's a, a once in a generation type of thing that would come along and help species that aren't, you know, game species typically, because those species need help too, right? And, and like I said earlier, sportsmen and women, we like all wildlife. We support wildlife and we want to see them healthy. And when you think about it, when you enhance and restore habitat, you're going to help game species. In any case, so really something folks should get behind. You can find a lot of information on NWF Outdoors products about Rawa as well. So that's the main one. But, you know, we continue to work on just about everything you can think of. There's going to be another one that your listeners may be interested in coming up. It's called the North American Grasslands Act. And for folks who don't know, grasslands are really an imperiled ecosystem in the United States. We've lost about 75% of them. That's where sage grouse live, bobwhite quail, lots of the different species that were traditionally sporting species that are now, you know, tougher and tougher to find sporting opportunities. And that act, this, you know, concept would model itself after the North American Wetlands Conservation Act, basically provide matching funds for restoring grasslands. And if folks who are duck hunters probably know well about NACA, the North American Wetlands Conservation Act. It's highly successful. It's restored tons of wetlands across the country and really improved duck hunting. So we hope to see something like that happen in grasslands. All right. Well, as you just heard, folks, there is a lot going on with the National Wildlife Federation. If you want to find out more and get involved with your state chapter, go to nwf.org. The website again, nwf.org, the National Wildlife Federation. Aaron, thanks for taking the time to tell us all about your organization today on Northwestern Outdoors Radio. Thank you, sir, for having me. Next up, another reminder about the Rogue River Salmon Derby coming up August 10th through the 13th at the Lower Rogue River at Gold Beach, Oregon. If you're looking for a great excuse to go fishing, this is definitely it. There's lots of cash and prizes to be won at this Salmon Derby, which is a blind bogey derby, meaning... It's not the biggest salmon that wins it. It's the salmon that is closest to the weight over 10 pounds that's drawn out of a hat. 
that wins it. And that salmon could be yours. You don't even need a boat to fish this. You can fish right off the bank and have success catching salmon at the mouth of the Rogue River. And best of all, all the proceeds are going to benefit the Curry Adronimus Fish Hatchery, a volunteer-run salmon hatchery located on the Rogue River. So get your tickets at the Rogue Outdoor Store in Gold Beach and plan on going fishing at the Rogue Salmon Derby August 10th through the 13th in Gold Beach. It's going to be a ton of fun. Enjoy a meal of wild Alaskan seafood delivered right to your door. Sea Sea offers premium quality wild Alaskan fish and shellfish to include Copper River King and Silver Salmon, Halibut, Black Cod, King Crab, and of course, Copper River Sockeye Salmon. Order it blast frozen or smoked and experience a slice of Alaska for a special meal you won't forget. Buy your seafood now at SeaNaSea.com. That's S-E-N-A-S-E-A, SeaNaSea.com. Anglers are getting a raise this year with the Northern Pike Minnow Sport Reward Fishery Program and the fish are biting. Here's how it works. First, register at a pike minnow station along the Columbia or Snake River. Next, go fishing for pike minnow and bring back all of them that measure 9 inches or longer. The fish are worth 6 8 or $10, and the more fish you catch, the more each one is worth. Keep an eye out for tagged fish, too, because those are worth 500 bucks. Go fishing, make money, and have fun. Find out more at pikeminnow.org. Located in the northeast corner of Oregon, Wallawa County offers a unique destination rich in natural beauty and outdoors recreation. Enjoy the clear waters of Wallawa Lake. Take a tram to the top of Mount Howard for million dollar views. Hike or ride into the Eagle Cap Wilderness and fish or raft the Wallawa and Grand Ronde Rivers. It's all waiting for you in beautiful Wallawa County. Plan your visit today at WallawaCountyChamber.com. That's WallawaCountyChamber.com. Sportsman's Warehouse is America's premier outfitter with the gear you need for fishing, hunting, camping, paddling, cooking, and just about anything else you can do in the woods or in the water. With over 125 stores across America, there is bound to be a Sportsman's Warehouse near you with not only the gear you need, but also the experts to help you get the most out of the product you purchase. Head down to your local Sportsman's Warehouse today or shop online anytime at sportsmans.com. That's sportsmans.com. From a bull elk ripping a bugle across the valley to wing beats on a duck marsh, public lands and waters are integral to our outdoor heritage. Become a member of Backcountry Hunters and Anglers and stand up for our public lands and waters. Visit backcountryhunters.org today. We've got time for one more shot of Northwestern Outdoors Radio with John Cruz. If you haven't already, it's time to lace up those hiking boots and hit the trail in a mountain range near you this summer. I'll be honest, I am long overdue for this after the broken leg I sustained last August, but I think I'm going to make a hike along a mountain stream or to a mountain lake in the week ahead, and I hope you will too if you need a new pair of boots like I did, you can find a very good selection of quality brands at your local Sportsman's Warehouse store. Danner, Merrill, Columbia Boots, and more are waiting for you, so head on down to America's premier outfitter, try on a few pairs, pick a winner, and hit the trail this summer in comfort and style. And now it's time for your Sportsman's Warehouse Trivia Question of the Week. It's about Glacier National Park. It's not only a magnificent national park to visit, but it's also an international park that extends into Canada. Here's your question. What is the Canadian part of Glacier National Park called? If you know the answer, you know what to do. Go to our Facebook page at Northwestern Outdoors Radio. Like and follow our page if you haven't already. That really helps us out. Then go to the post thread where we've got the question and give us your answer. If you don't do Facebook, I really do understand. Just go to our website then at northwesternoutdoors.com and let us know the Canadian name for their national park that is part of Glacier National Park. One lucky person who guesses right wins that $25 gift card we give away every week from Sportsman's Warehouse. As we wrap things up, I do hope you are staying healthy this summer. I'm sorry to say that after two and a half years, I did finally catch the coronavirus. So far, it's 
Been like dealing with a nasty cold with a fair amount of coughing and hacking and some fatigue, but nothing too severe. A case in point, I'm recording this show today in my home studio with COVID. I'm grateful this illness isn't more severe, and talking to several of my friends who have caught it recently, it really does seem to be mild compared to what folks went through when COVID-19 first arrived in early 2020, and that has got to be a good thing. Like I said, I want to get hiking, so I need to shake this illness off. Here's hoping you get a healthy dose of Mother Nature in your life as well this week. Until next time... Do take care, God bless, and make it a point to spend some time outdoors.